Hello, my name is Dr. Joanne Bezubitz, and I am the President and CEO of the Royal. Today, I'm having a special conversation with someone that is well known around the world for her courage in speaking out about her mental illness. And that person is Margaret Trudeau. For the Royal, Margaret Trudeau is a beacon of that hope, of optimism, and transformation. After years of suffering in silence from a then undiagnosed mental illness, she sought help from the Royal. Once diagnosed with bipolar disorder, Mrs. Trudeau was treated and found the ability to live life fully again. Since then, she has dedicated her energy to speaking about mental illness and writing about her personal struggles in her book, Changing My Mind. She has since then written two other books, The Time of Your Life and A Certain Woman of an Age. In March 2016, we named Margaret our first honorary patron of the Royal. We also dedicated a butterfly garden in her honor, which we joyfully celebrated with her entire family. And yes, with the Prime Minister and Sophie Grégoire Trudeau and all their children and many grandchildren. So many grandchildren. <laughs> Yes, wonderful. Margaret, Hello, how are Joanne. you doing? Well, thank you. Uh, like everyone, um, what has it been, 14 months that we've been isolated? Yeah. And I'm a senior now, you can tell. I uh, am 72. And so uh, my family just made me protect myself. There was no, no question. So for 14 months, I've been alone. And I... I found it uh, rewarding in some ways and so difficult in other ways because this is not normal to be isolated, not at all. I know when I was uh, suffering from mental illness with depression, one of the signs that I was going into depression was that I would give up on the outside world. I'd give up on my friends. I'd give up on my the things I always loved to do because the depression, the illness had taken me. But now it's not an illness. It's not, it's not by choice, is it, Joanne? Mm -hmm. And Margaret, what are some of the strategies that you've used to cope in the past 14 months? <laughs> well, I've had typical of my life i just haven't just had covid uh, and the pandemic um a year ago i lost my home to a a fire and uh, i have had to live i lived in a hotel and now i live in a, in a rental uh, furnished apartment waiting to go home uh it was quite serious and i suffered uh, trauma of course being burnt by a fire and uh and I lost so much, but I had to get used to that. And then I came down with quite a, a grave illness and, and spent some time in the hospital. So I've had a lot of things going on in the last year besides just COVID. And so my strategies have been sort of exaggerated as always my life seems to be in that I've really had to take care of myself. I've had to be in touch with my doctors. I've had to uh, really be compliant about my medication, be compliant about my, my, the reality that I have a mental illness. Um, unfortunately, there is not a cure for, for bipolar, uh, the, the, the condition that I have. You just have to manage your life really well. You have to make healthy choices. You have to get a good night's sleep. You have to eat for your healthy brain as well as your body. And you have to exercise. And you have to contribute and have purpose and be social and be present. And all those things were taken away from all of us a year ago. And uh, my biggest strategy to cope, I, I think, has been to do the things that I always have to do in order to stay healthy mentally and physically. I, I have routines and I do little things that make me happy and I keep in touch with my friends on FaceTime. And I have a grandson who was born on March 15th in the south of France. So I, my daughter had her first baby. 
Uh, I thank goodness for FaceTime so that I can watch every little day him growing. But it's such, families are just mm -hmm. divided. We can't do the things that we always thought we would do that would bring us joy and others joy. So mm -hmm. strategies, uh, keep on keeping on, I guess. Uh, try and make yourself uh, uh, important. Um, don't, don't let yourself feel less because of the pandemic, uh, be in touch with others, particularly your doctors, if you if you need treatment. Joanne, I have to ask you this from your point of view: um, Are people who have mental illness and who regularly see their doctors and and are followed up and can ask questions and get help um, during the pandemic? Have you seen at the hospital that people have been doing that? Have been keeping up with their doctors or? I went through a period where I didn't think I was important enough to to take up time. Yeah, we, we, yeah, that's a really good question, Margaret, and I think it's a good point of discussion. And uh, what we are finding is that people are continuing to reach out, and that uh, we've put a lot of um, some a lot of thought into how we can continue to be engaged with our clients. And we have moved to uh, virtual capabilities, and that's not for yeah. everyone. But uh, you know, donations. We've been able to make some technologies available to clients and family members, so they can stay connected, and so that clients can stay connected to their therapists or their physicians. So that's um, you know that's, that's been a strategy that we've put in place. But I think for the most part. The majority of people who were engaged with the Royal uh, at the onset of the pandemic have continued to be engaged with the Royal and we have new people Good. who have reached out. Because it's very important. The, the most important thing for those of us who who are managing well with our mental illness, having been diagnosed, know what we're dealing with, have got sought treatment, and and yet suddenly we find ourselves without a life like everyone else. I don't know whether mm -hmm. knowing that everyone else is going through the same thing, the same isolation and sadness and feelings of grief and fear until we get vaccinated that we might die alone. Um, all of these things are real, uh, but I don't know if Sharon, knowing that everyone else is feeling the same, it necessarily makes you feel better. You, you still have your own well, love, and for you not to yeah. absolutely give yourself importance that uh, if you're not mm -hmm. feeling well, if you don't want to get out of bed, if you don't want to feed yourself properly, if you don't want to go out for a walk every day, if you don't want to talk to anyone, these are signs as they would be with when if there was no uh, sheltering like we're doing now, these would be signs that you need to reach out for help, that you need to get a, a second opinion, so to speak. You need to be told how how best you can manage uh, and, and to be reminded uh, of the lessons you've learned in treatment, the lessons that you've learned of how to slow down in your life and, and, and pay attention to the details and and, mm -hmm. and get your sleep and, and be part of, uh, of life. And we're not allowed to be part of life, but we can be. And I see many, many stories. Uh, and I like to see the stories where people are doing wonderful things because of the pandemic and to show others that they care and reaching out in communities and making sandwiches and making signs and walking by and waving. In, uh, to the elderly uh, it's going to be over that's the good news isn't it just yeah it is it is it really is margaret i'd love to go back to uh something that you mentioned earlier because i'm quite amazed at what you shared with us today regarding not only the impact that the pandemic has had on you but also other life experiences that you've had like the fire <laughs> And your illness. Yeah, yeah and, and you used to I, say I was an exaggeration. <laughs> but yeah. but but still, I mean, despite all of that, I mean that all really happened. It's very, very remarkable. What an amazing, amazing story. Uh for Do you know you that at each part of it was and I 
I think of life as a learning curve that every day I want to learn something new. Mm -hmm. I, I try and stoke my curiosity. When it starts to fade, I get worried about myself because I think we have to try and know more all the time. And uh, But I learn, I mean, from the fire, how extraordinary to go from a comfortable life to suddenly having nothing, having very, very little uh, and being very very frightened and and traumatized and I had short-term memory loss I I was confused I, I it, mm -hmm. it was uh, I I did get the help I needed uh, that certainly from a physical standpoint I had every test no mm -hmm. they were very good here in, in Montreal mm -hmm. but getting accepting that this had happened to me and I I didn't know that I was carrying a disease it's quite common in elderly unfortunately and it's not COVID related I didn't know I was carrying uh, this disease. I just knew that I had a terrible backache that I've had for about three years. And I was under doctor's care, but he hadn't recognized what was really wrong with me. So uh, in November, it just all came to a head and I, I went through the emergency door and had surgery and recovery and more mm. hospitalizations. Just uh, And I... I again, you know, I, 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 Joanne, I've spoken so often to so many, so confidently that you can manage your mental illness, that it is a possibility that you, if you just get the right tools and you have an open mind and you're willing to listen and not resist, you can live a, a very good uh, co contributing life. Well, when I was in hospital in terrible pain, I... I I went completely mad. I, I, my bipolar came back in spades. I, I, I was mm. just a, a, a very, very unhappy and distressed and fearful. And, and uh, but the difference in uh, 20, uh, 21, uh, from when I was first diagnosed in, in, in the 70s with bipolar, uh, the treatment I got was immediate and, and right on. In fact, it was one of the orderlies, dear sweet Olivia, who noticed that I was having an awful lot of time, trouble managing with the pain. I was just so fearful. And she said, Margaret, Margaret, you're having a panic attack. What do you take? And I immediately responded to her of the psychotropic drug that I, I take. And quickly the nurses re responded. And an in-house uh, that's at the general psychiatrist came to visit me. And I got uh, quickly out of the bipolar that I had managed to get mm. my... I, I didn't want to be yeah. there. I never thought I would be there again. I yeah. never thought I would be manic again. I never thought I would have so much fear and so much so much sadness. Mm -hmm. overwhelming sadness unrealistic but uh, these are the times <laughs> and I, I I was very grateful that uh, and I and I know that it's part of the work that you've done Joanne at the Royal Ottawa and, at, at, mm -hmm. and, and other uh, institutions of mental health and mental wellness and mental care that the stigma has broken down and people are willing to say the truth about what is going on in their minds and not mm -hmm. hide it and not put on masks. And I was able to mm -hmm. say I am bipolar and I am having a manic episode at help. And the help was immediately understood and I got it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, it and it really, it, it made me understand that uh, I, I felt kind of a little ashamed, sort of, Joanne, because mm. uh, the pain I was in was really, really bad. And here I've been talking always about emotional pain that I felt and blah, blah, blah. And this was the real deal. This was the excruciating pain that I had to deal with. And so it made me understand yeah. so much about how people suffer and what people can do to alleviate their pain, how they have to reach out for help and accept the help that's there for them how they have to protect themselves uh, from uh, becoming ill, from, uh, live well, take care of yourselves. Because a disease, uh, pain, being hospitalized, the, fret, the fear of it all, it's very real and it's raw. And I, I never, in one of my hallucinations, um, I had taken a, a medication that gave me quite severe hallucinations and uh, I was quickly taken off of it. But uh, uh, I, I was waiting for my babies to be brought to me to feed. I, I am a little old lady, I'm my 
appreciated as well. I certainly don't have anything to offer, but I had only ever been in the hospital to have babies, uh, really, except for the time in the psychiatric mm -hmm. hospital, which was a very different experience. But I, I, there was so much fear involved and so much displacement of suddenly finding myself very ill. And that we can take over to how people who are suddenly very, very ill with COVID are, are the position that they're put in and how isolated they are and how, how hard it is mm -hmm. for family to comfort, for family to support. Uh, but you must, you must. I mean, the Facebook and, and, uh, and FaceTime and, and calls late at night where my son and, and his darling wife would rock me to sleep in their arms on over over the iPad. I mean, I, 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 I was so, so grateful yeah. that I had that, even that kind of support. Mm -hmm. And I know that's what we have to give. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that people will suffer mentally uh, and physically during this pandemic. And we have, uh, myself, just to an extreme but uh, most people and, and and as well the day I got my vaccination Joanne as I'm sure you must have felt I was I was the most joyful person I was so the side of that was gratitude uh, because I have 10 grandchildren and I want to live I didn't want to die alone in a hospital uh, as mm. as Without the vaccination, I very well might. We all might. <laughs> so, uh, my gratitude that that so quickly we we've got the vaccination. Uh, here yes. we don't even have a vaccination yet for AIDS, the virus, and yet we, the world responded. The scientific uh, world responded so quickly to this dreadful pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there yeah. is hope, and that's where hope lives. But. And, and we're getting more into this, where if we have survived the winter, the cold, cold, lonely winter, and now we're out into spring, and we know with COVID that we must be outside. That, that Why be inside? Why be near anybody, really? I have the luxury of living alone with my cat, but it's not a luxury often. You, It's lonely sometimes. No. But I'm not going to get you know, COVID. But being outside, no. you can get away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, Margaret, I, I hear so much compassion in your words and so much feeling and how you're speaking about people who have mental illness or substance use disorders or have come in contact with COVID and are, are living with that or the impact of that. I, I hear compassion in your voice. I also hear a lot of hope and resilience i mean i think you're a living example well, of what well, we have a choice and yet we don't have a choice i i i mm -hmm. like anybody uh, with a mental illness, well, from time to time, think, is it, when, when my suffering is great, think, it, is it worth it? Well, I have 10 pairs of eyes of my grandchildren that uh, uh, it is worth it to fight my hardest to stay alive, to protect myself in every way, to not make any uh, missteps in this uh, uh, pandemic that will get me uh, infected. So I, I I think that's a resilience that we all have to find to know that uh, that we don't really have a choice. We all have to live. We all have to try our hardest to stay alive mm -hmm. and to be the mm -hmm. whole people that we are. Even though we feel now, I know myself, my friends who I talk to, all of us, we don't have any purpose. We don't get validated. Uh, when we when we're stuck at home, uh, we don't get hugs, we don't get giggles, we don't get immediate responses. Uh, things are a little stilted with FaceTime, particularly with the younger ones. But still, we have this great advantage. But I'm I'm, I'm say, not saying that everybody has this advantage. Many people mm -hmm. perhaps don't have internet and can't reach out to 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 their loved ones. I, I found myself reading again. I saved some books. I was naughty. I couldn't bear that. They 
the insurance company told me all of my books were were ruined and I, I saved a few and cleaned them very well and I've been reading a lot and that's something that I think instead of just watching <laughs> watching television all the time because what else is there to do mm -hmm. Netflix 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 uh, I've been reading and I've really been enjoying once again having a book in hand and there's mm -hmm. time for reflection there's time for going back I have a lot of work with photographs always as a photographer and an archivist so I, I keep myself going but uh, I, I try not to watch things that, that take me down I certainly I had to, like so many, uh, before the November election, just not watch American television because the noise that came mm -hmm. out of, of, of the politics down there was, was very distressing, I think, to many of us. And I know listening that last night, uh, well, re uh, all of his recent press conferences and public announcements, that Biden is, is answering a huge need for us all, of giving us hope, of making things better, of getting people back, mm -hmm. back to work and, and helping those who, who need really need the help. And people who never thought they would ask for help, ever, uh, uh, suddenly are jobless and maybe without the eviction uh, laws, homeless, uh, and it's everything is different. I think we're, Joanne, how do you think we're going to come out of this? Are we going to be better people? Are we going to be stronger people? I, I think we're going to be a changed people. And, you yes. know, one of the questions that I was going to ask you that you already answered, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about it, is, you know, what are some of the different things that we've introduced to our lives as a result of our mental illness that wasn't there before? Or what else have we introduced as a result of, um, you know, lockdown and the impact of the pandemic? And you mentioned, you know, going back to your reading, uh, looking at photographs. Um, maintaining connection with family and friends as much as possible. Yeah. And seeing things yeah. through your grandchildren's eyes. What else have you injected in your life, either today, now, or previously, when you were just coming out in your journey? I, I've always recovery? found always the, found uh, uh, when I was just coming in, uh, in recovery, uh, after my son died 23 years ago now it is when I, I really completely uh, became very very mentally ill uh, in my recovery uh, my psychiatrist had me listen to music uh, uh, to slow my mind down and so I would relax otherwise I was just pacing all the time so I, I started listening to music with earphones on and I listened to all the classics I, I listened to CBC because I couldn't get up and change discs or do anything i was pretty useless at the beginning but i found the music was it was the most soothing and the best thing i could do and i learned so much from it uh, about classical music and any music and so every day i i'm an opera buff so every day i i put on the on this huge big television in this rented place i have i i, I put it on something called stingray opera <laughs> and just listen to the best of the best the voices, the voices that have hope, that have sorrow, that have emotion. Uh, our emotions are all valuable and we can't dismiss them. And if we do feel sad and don't feel, you know, just are overcome with grief, um, it's best to share it. It always is. Uh, you don't have to share it with your doctor. You can just call mm. a friend and together you can, you'll end up laughing. I know I always do because, um, when you have a, a friend who or, or someone you can talk to who who knows you a little bit they can quickly change your your channel because they know you're stuck you, your groove of your record is stuck and you've mm -hmm. got to move on you can't stay stuck and and yet here for 14 months we've been isolated in our in our spaces uh, i i just can't I, I think a lot of us might have trouble even getting back into life of, of redoing mm. the things we once did before. Uh, I myself have watched this show called Mayday, which is about airplane crashes. So I don't know if I'm ever getting on an airplane again. So I don't know of these kinds of things because I've never seen anything like it. We, we can damage mm. ourselves and our perceptions by watching and, and, and doing the wrong things. There's just no question. We can get ourselves in a very mm. low place. So I try and choose 
uplifting things and, and doing things that have a positive result. I like to cook. I like mm -hmm. to. I have lots of plants uh, in my windowsill to getting ready to go outside on the terrace that I don't have right now. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I I think every day you have to do a little small thing that makes you happy. Uh, mm -hmm. Take care of yourself uh, and be ready when it's all open again and you're going to be so joyful. I know I am. Just I think I might mm -hmm. get in trouble because I'm just going to want to touch and hug everybody I see. <laughs> I, 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 I certainly yeah. have that feeling often when I see fat babies on the side of the street to go over and just hug them because I'm missing touching my own little grandchildren. Oh. But uh, it's oh. in time, it's a That's lesson so for us all. And Canadians yeah, have been so I'm really so proud mm. uh, to be Canadian, aren't mm. you, Joanne? I just oh, I yeah, think definitely. Canadians are just such good people, and uh, I, yeah. uh, we we we've all struggled together over the years, making this country and making it equal and strong and welcoming, and and our education system and our health system are all well in place. We're doing so well, but the main thing that we have to remember is how kind we are as Canadians, why mm -hmm. not? Why not? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no no reason not to be kind when you live in a country that can be so cruel in the winter, uh, so cold and so very hot sometimes in the summer that you you learn how yeah. to be a survivor on the land and you learn the value of, mm -hmm. of of kindness and friendship and helping one another out. That's the adaptation, isn't it? That uh, that as human. We, yeah. we do I, when I, we're in I, environmental situations. And knowing, and, and again, we go back to the, the, the same problem that's always there in mental illness. It certainly was in me, and it, it's just very common uh, that the person who is clearly suffering and the rational people around uh, the person can clearly see uh, that they need help, that they're not uh, in, in connecting well to reality, that they are spinning off into something. Uh, and yet our resistance is, it just always awes me as how stubborn the human mind can be, how, how we can have this feeling that nobody can help us and nobody can change us because we're just fine the way we are, when that, that just simply isn't the reality. We, we're, we're losing our friends, we're losing our jobs, we're losing our money, we're losing our life because if we're not treated for mm -hmm. a mental illness. For me, it's, it, Joanne, it, it really is, the line I draw and uh, with compassion and I'm not trying not to be judgmental of people. I know the struggles that everyone has. I, I know them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there are people with mental illness who are doing very, very well with their lives. They're contributing, they're happy, they're mm -hmm. in place and they're authentic. And those are people who have been treated. And then there's the untreated. Mm -hmm. and. They still keep hitting the, the obstacle again and again in front of them because they have nobody who can really help them, guide them to the right path in their life, the right way uh, of living and, and thinking instead of the way they are. The resistance is the hardest thing and I, I see it again and again. I know it was in me. Uh, it took the tragedy of the death of my son to for me to totally wake up. I had been mm -hmm. told for years and I, I, I taken treatment and I visited psychiatrists and I placated everyone that I was in, I was fine. Uh, well, I sort of was. I was living a very good life, but uh, I wasn't fine mm -hmm. the minute I lost my son. I, I went very mad with mm -hmm. grief and I needed help so badly. Uh, that and I was so resistant that uh, my my son, not Justin, uh, uh, brought me to the doors of the Royal Ottawa Hospital through the emergency mm -hmm. because his mummy was so sick, and he knew mm -hmm. that I had to have help. And my gratitude uh, for the help that I got and the way it changed my life um, and my mm -hmm. family's life, the collateral damage is pretty big. Uh, in a family when someone is mentally ill and won't uh, get treatment and won't get better. 
uh, everybody is hurt. Everybody is is is. Uh, and I think the thing, one of the things that made me so badly want to get well, and to be very compliant and to take do the treatment, and it took a long time. Mm -hmm. I was a hard nut to crack, long time. Uh, but mm -hmm. it was I. I didn't want to keep letting down the people I love the most uh, with my mood swings, with my changes of, of emotions, with my rages, with my with my sadness. I wanted to be a consistent person and I found that through treatment mm -hmm. uh, and I advocate it, I write about it, I do a play about it. Um, yeah. It's just so important to reach the point of acceptance uh, that and who mm -hmm. who's to say what's normal? What's normal is you being your authentic self, being able to be the best you can be. Uh, nobody's exactly like you. N no one's just the same. And you may have different. Not you may be diagnosed as I am with bipolar, but there may maybe some other little things going on as well. Uh, there always are. Uh, it's just being honest about it and and knowing it. And I learned. Um, through my treatment, how to do this wonderful thing called self-monitoring, where when I start mm. to go down that rabbit hole of depression, I just put my hand up like that little little woman in, in the South who said, I ain't going to take this no more. And I just say, no, not now. Not now. You're not, I'm not mm. getting depressed today. I don't have time. Mm -hmm. uh, because the neural pathway to depression is very hard to close. You After you've had depressive effort, episodes mm -hmm. you you it's like a water slide sometimes so it's so easy to let your thoughts quickly put you down into that rabbit hole mm -hmm. and I just stop no no and I have to do I have to call my funny friend and, and I or I have to quickly bake some cookies to take over to the grandchildren or, or my children at the time I have to do something positive to not be that person who is going to sink again into that nothingness of depression. Uh, depression is the biggest thing. Margaret, I, I want to share something with you because uh, I don't think we've ever had this conversation, but my mother also had bipolar disorder. Oh, Joanne. And, and and I'm, you know, maybe this is why I'm so drawn to the explanations that you provide because I've never had a conversation with her where she explained the waterfall of depression or some of the other um, experiences the way that you have. You are helping me understand oh, my thank family you, and helping me understand myself. So I really want to thank you for, for being so open and sharing. And I'm sure there are going to be other people who are listening today who are saying, oh, that's what it is. Now I get it. So. I, well, I just would like to encourage you to continue. Thank you. That's very, very kind. Thank you. I, I've uh, been doing this now, telling my story, learning as much as I can from the mental health mm -hmm. community as, as I'm crossing the country, public speaking in different communities, of what the treatments they're using. How open are people to getting help? How do you reach the people that need the help the most? And what works the best? So I really, and I, I just feel that my father was a Scot, and he was a great storyteller and teacher, and as was his father. Uh, and I think it's just a, a thing. Some people like to talk. Some people People like to mm -hmm. articulate and I think I have in mm -hmm. my journey found the words that work uh, it's very hard I know at the beginning I had no idea I didn't I look at my journals and the words make no sense because I could not understand what was going on it was the kindness and the intelligence of my doctor Colin at, at, at the ROH uh, who who helped me uh, understand uh, the words and by teaching me what was going on in my brain, what mm -hmm. mania was caused by, what depression was caused by. Well, it's hormones. It's it, it's a wild ride of hormones, which can be controlled with medication. It's quite mm -hmm. easy to control these, but it's a, a fine, uh, unfortunately, it's a fine tuning is hard. 
uh, with with drugs and pharmaceuticals and and your confidence it, it doesn't happen immediately yeah. that you get better it, it's baby steps as as you've never known baby steps uh, and it's your family I my biggest support was my darling daughter and she just mommy you got your hair done like it was like it was a huge big thing and she made me feel good about the smallest little steps that i was taking mm -hmm. and and get it coming back into reality of facing my life and its its responsibilities uh so i i i, I know the words I, I and i know the feelings and, I, and i'm trying and i with mm -hmm. my play uh, a certain woman of an age uh i'm trying to do it with humor and in, in 90 minutes, make people go on the ride with me uh, and hear what happened. So, because it's happened to someone out there too, mm -hmm. uh, a lot maybe. It's your sister, it's your cousin, it may be yourself, uh, your colleague. Mm -hmm. People are suffering. And by us knowing more and being not judgmental, but being helpful and useful to them. I always say when people ask me, well, what can I do as a mother? of someone who, who is in having a mental health episode what can i do they won't listen to me i can what can i do well i tell them what you can do uh in, with your beautiful rational mind is what we would in the episode cannot do is you can access reason and, and find out everything you can about depression you can get uh, uh, so much information good information on the internet uh, about mental illness about depression about mm. the symptoms about uh, mania about schizophrenia about anxiety about all of the things that we can suffer from uh, and you with your rational mind and then I don't want you to become the teacher if you they can very carefully plant a few little seeds from the knowledge that you have about what is happening to the person uh, we'll resist you if you try and lecture us and tell us that what we have to do but if you plant the seed about how much better we could live how much freer we would be from the demons that are haunting us if we just uh, took it seriously accepted we have a, a problem and sought treatment and treatment is not your family or your friends and it's certainly not yourself mm -hmm. because we can't analyze ourselves we just trick ourselves into thinking we're fine uh, and our family doesn't want to know the mm -hmm. horrors that we know so getting to a third party getting to somebody who can help you is the beginning of hope it's the beginning of getting your your life you always dreamed you'd have and somehow nothing's working out nothing's working out earlier in our conversation Margaret you talked about the importance of science and how it had accelerated to address the pandemic and as I'm listening to you speak today I'm also hearing that there is a place for science in the treatment of mental illness and the advancement of science when it comes to mental illness is equally important because if we can use predictive medicine or if we can have indication that someone is going to develop a mental illness we can intervene sooner i wonder if you'd by sharing with us some of the changes over the years that you've seen in the advancement so of science and treatment at the beginning, mm -hmm. if I when I was manic, you know, like in the seventies, I was put on a drug that put me in my place. I didn't know my place was in front in front of television all day, uh, eating cookies. That I would lose my ability to engage and contribute because I was so slowed down by the medication mm. uh, and maybe having too much of it or not the right dose but i found it dreadful i wasn't myself i thought it was like like being put in prison almost being not allowed to be free not allowed to be me uh, the new medications mm -hmm. uh, which have come so far really relieve you of the symptoms without altering your mood i mean without making you too uh, uh, drugged up, if you know what I mean. Uh, so I, yeah. I, I think that there's a, there's a, the science is very important, and that's the the brain health, and that's very important. But then mm -hmm. there's our minds, and that's the other side, mm -hmm. and that's more where art lives. 
because that's where emotions are. That's where our feelings are. That's where our spirituality lives. Not in the, in the brain function. It lives out of our, our minds. So if we can get a healthy brain, if we can get the hormones properly balanced chemically, and then we can work on the mind. And that, mm -hmm. so it's a two-sided approach. And the more that mm -hmm. researchers work to understand the brain, the more chance we have, uh, honestly, of, of really mm -hmm. making a big difference in the lives of people who live with mental illness. And as you know, at the Royal, we've got a brain imaging center and uh, we're looking at brain health and uh, what we can learn about the brain so that we can make advancements in the treatment of mental illness and substance use disorders, something that's become more and more important. It, it's just exciting. It really is when you and I spend a good amount of time not being an expert, but just so curious, looking at some of the uh, work that's, that researchers are quietly doing and never really knowing what effect they have on, on real mm -hmm. patients. But boy, I just have such gratitude for them because the brain is so complex. And we, we mm -hmm. now, because once we've got this kind of imaging that you're talking about, these brain scans, and we can really understand the individual function of each person's brain, then we're getting so close to being able mm -hmm. to make corrections where corrections are needed and predict, uh, as you say, be predictive about the path that someone will have without intervention. Exactly. I well, see that my, do that I, I'm very other... embarrassed. I, I see that my computer, my, my, my iPad might uh, die. I hope not. Oh, I have 10 okay. Minutes. Well, well, let's, <laughs> well, let's go we as can, long as I think we I'm can. We have it. a few more minutes. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. El electronics. And, and, so, you know, here's, here's a parallel that I'm drawing from what you said today. You're talking about personalized medicine. We're talking about the individual's brain and being under, able to understand the inner workings of a person. And earlier in the conversation, you were talking about the importance of autonomy and independence as a person. They really do go hand in glove with one another, don't they? Um, this idea that, and this was the epiphany for me when I got into the Royal uh, with my complete breakdown in my recovery, the epiphany w to me uh, was this was my battle, mine alone. Uh, mm -hmm. The doctors and nurses uh, could guide me, could use their intelligence, their, their expertise to try and get me, uh, get me well, uh, but it was up to me. It was up to me to want to be better. It was up to me to to say no to bad choices, to, to get a healthy life mm -hmm. happening, a really healthy life. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's it's my it's your inner battle. And to to get people to have the courage to face that inner inner instinct that they have, that they're not quite as healthy mentally as they'd like to be, or they're not quite getting it. They're not fitting in as much as they would like to. I, I, I find that the mind is, is, once you get your brain health going, you have a healthier mind too. So once you're eating well and sleeping, mm -hmm. sleeping of course is, is number one, and getting yourself into a good, good life where good choices day to day uh, start, start making life very pleasurable. But it, it's, it's a battle. You need the support. It's very hard to do without. I, I sometimes say that getting your diagnosis of mental illness is really like those uh, five stages of, of accepting of, of dying that Kubler Ross, Dr. Mm. Kubler Ross came out with so long ago, you can apply them to getting the diagnosis that you have a mental illness. At first, you'll, you'll just deny it. No, not me, you're wrong, you're just wrong. And then you'll start bargaining. Well, if I just did some yoga, if I just ate healthier grain bread and sprouts or whatever, you bargain and, and then you get really, really angry and, and start pushing everybody away because you're angry and then you're depressed and then you get so depressed and then you, you're just so sad because it's starting to come on to you you're starting to realize the truth of it and then the final stage where you accept and say I have a mental illness I need help so that I can live my life well 
but it's and do you easy. ever <laughs> well it, you you don't make it sound easy margaret but it, it you do make it sound like it takes a tremendous amount of courage and a tremendous amount of insight do you ever have those same revelations today even as you're further down your recovery path, do you still ever go through those stages of, oh, yes. of real? Oh, yes. Uh, I, I have to remind those closest to me um, that I, have, I am bipolar and to not be too judgy about me uh, because I, I can you know, I can get too excited. I can get terribly sad and overreact to my grief. Uh, but mostly, mostly, uh, I'm fine. Mostly. And it's because I self-monitor, which I talked about a little bit, which I have learned to do, mm -hmm. of really being conscious of your emotions, of feeling them, of not dismissing them. When you're angry, go down and find out why you're feeling so angry. And instead of just lashing mm -hmm. out, don't say the thing, words you can't take back. Have sober second thought before you lash out in anger at someone, which is overreactive probably and not what you really wanted to do. So you have to learn all the skills of slowing down, of being careful of how you, uh, in your relationships, of treating them with such kindness and, and calm, not being... And if you can't be that way, well, your family and your friends and the people who love you just have to say, well, that's Margaret. You know, that's her. <laughs> and, I, I, and they know I need a little help. And usually it's just a nice, uh, you know, cup of tea and sh shoulder to cry on or, or, or usually laughter. I, I'm someone who greatly believes in the value of humor in your life and of being able to laugh at yourself and others. I think I remember, Joanne, at the beginning of this pandemic, we had a lot of jokes. They were flying around every day. There was yeah. a new cartoon with Trump with his mask on his eyes or what, his face mask on his whatever. There was always a joke. Uh, we stopped laughing uh -huh. halfway through, didn't we, Jess? And, uh, but it's uh -huh. important to laugh. It's important to find lightness in life. You can't always be serious and, and perfect. There's no such thing. What's next for you, Margaret, in terms of your campaign oh, no. to advocate for mental illness? <laughs> What's next for you? Well, I love my play, Joanne. I, I love uh, what I can do on stage. I, I just love it. So I'm looking forward to uh, doing more of my my play. I, I don't know. I, I thought I had another book in me, but I obviously don't because I haven't written a word. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, um, I'm like everybody, sort of cautious about what's in, what's in front. And because I've had this health scare, which I have will have complete recovery from it still won't be up that I'm, I, I'm not 22 anymore I may be in my mind in my youthful enthusiasm about life but my body uh, betrays that I, I, I think growing old it, it, with grace is <laughs> is going to be the biggest challenge mm -hmm. and what message do you have for others that might be at the beginning of their recovery journey Oh, it just gets so much better uh, day by day, mm. one day at a time. I, I just really like the idea uh, that Tolle had in his book, The Power of Now, of living in the now, mm. of not dwelling too much on your past and your past mistakes, not becoming burdened down by, by the past, uh, nor getting too confident in what your future will be. Uh, I know from the death of my son that everything can change in one minute, you know, in your life. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, you have to, uh, you have to be authentic and honest about yourself and, and every day do little kind things for someone be smile and be nice uh, it all comes back giving is the best thing to do the best. and how can we give when we're all trapped inside so i i hope to be able to be out there and, and practice what i preach a little bit more 
And do you have any message of hope for people who are struggling with dealing with the pandemic? Oh, I think we all are starting to breathe because we, with the number of people who have been vaccinated now, and we know the vaccination is the, is the way out, it's the golden ticket. And that uh, we will, I, I have from a source, uh, high up in the government, uh, that uh, most Canadians who want it will have their first shot by Canada Day. And many of us yeah. will have had our second. So it, it'll yes. be the fall, I expect. Uh, it'll take mm -hmm. the summer of still being very careful. Uh, these variants yes. are wicked. Uh, mask wearing mm -hmm. and being careful, but we will be relieved. And once you've got that relief, it isn't an unrealistic fear that we've all carried. It's a real fear. This is a real thing. Yeah. This is death. This is losing a loved one. And, and we thought it was just elderly, mm -hmm. but it's all ages. And it's, it's dreadful. Yeah. Uh, and for me, knowing what happens to the family when you lose a loved one too early, it's nothing but grief and pain for the rest of your life. So by taking active, proactive, uh, uh, strong stand against the, the, the germ by keeping it at bay and doing the right things, we're going to be free again. And I think we'll be better for it. I, I just can't wait uh, to get out there. <laughs> I like everyone. Enough is enough. So amid the, uh, the horrors that have been on our doorstep due to the pandemic, um, I think your story today and your sharing of your life experience has been a real beacon of hope oh, for so you, many Joanne. people. Thank you, Well, so it, thank me. you very much. Thank you very much. I really I, appreciate it. Well, I, I can't tell you. Uh, the, seeking treatment at the Royal Ottawa and, and every town has treatment available in Canada. You just have to ask for it. The treatment that I got uh, changed the trajectory of my life and uh, gave my family their mom back. And I'm the happiest Grammy yummy you could ever imagine, except I can't see them now. But I keep in touch and, and life can be so good if you could just uh, have the courage, find the courage in you to ask for help. What a story of courage and, and a story <laughs> of compassion. And I think, Margaret, you know, compassion is not something that you can buy at a drugstore. You know, compassion. No, no, I guess not. Uh, you live it, you mm -hmm. learn in life. Your compassion grows if your heart is open. And if, uh, compassion, according to the Dalai Lama, who I have always uh, listened to, his wisdom, uh, compassion, uh, being a compassionate person is how you become a happy person. And with if you want to alleviate words, the suffering of others, you will be a happy person. So I hope so. Thank I like, you very I much. I like being a happy person. Thank you, Joanne. A pleasure talking to Thank you, you and talking Margaret. to everyone. Thank you, Joanne. I'm sure I, I'm sharing everyone's happiness and enthusiasm for having you today share your day with us and uh, your words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Margaret. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. My honor. <laughs>